and um, he's going to tell us about collective motion and decision making in animal groups. Well, thank you very much, and it's uh, wonderful to, to follow Deborah. Um, I actually did my PhD studying ant behavior, and so that's actually where I started getting interested in these types of well, groups, largely because of, of some of her papers. Uh, but now I'm particularly fascinated by the highly coordinated behavior we see in organisms such as these. These are silver-side fish, and shortly you'll see the European starling. And you'll clearly see that there's high coordination among these individuals. But what's different to the ants that we just learnt about is that these individuals are unrelated to each other. So from an evolutionary perspective, it's much harder to try to understand why indeed they form these highly coordinated uh, behaviours. And if you sort of zoom in on one of these groups, I, I love this photograph, I stole this from Qantas In Flight magazine, and I've added this, these arrows here that show the sort of uh, swirl of these sheep. These are sheep crossing a bridge. And what I like about it is you can see the biosocial interactions, this attraction to each other that keeps these groups together and gives them this characteristic pattern that we see that we know is a group. We can also see that individuals, if they can, tend to maintain a, a minimum space between themselves, but sometimes, as you can see them compressed over the bridge, it's a little bit like bacteria. The frictional forces of the bodies then become important in the pattern-forming process. You can see also with these sheep here that they tend to be aligning their direction of travel with their neighbours. And I'm sure we're going to learn more about the importance of alignment in the, in the, the, the following talk by Thomas Fischer. And so when you sort of integrate these behavioural rules, we get the types of collective patterns we see in nature. But individuals are responding to those local conditions, but they're also reconciling that with goal-oriented behaviour in many cases, such as during migration. So these sheep are... are, are and, you know, they're not the smartest animals out there, but they're not particularly stupid. I mean, they may know that they get fed in certain places at certain times of the day. And so you have this reconciliation of memory-based effects and local information. <clears throat> they also perceive, uh, you know, as you saw them interacting with that bridge, they also interact with the outside world in different ways. This person here is perceived as a threat. And so they maintain what we call a vacuum around the individual to give themselves enough time, presumably, to escape should that person indeed start chasing after them, something that happens quite a lot in the northeast of Scotland, where I'm from. <laughs> and uh, you see, <laughs> but we, you know, as, as we've seen in some of the previous talks, we can really take these types of concepts and ideas and apply them literally to the microscopic scale, looking at cell-cell interactions. There's some work I'm doing with John Bonner, who works on Dictostelio. I'm also very interested in some of the other systems people have talked about. I've just started some work on, on tumours, looking again at sort of density-dependent transitions in behavior within these organizations. <clears throat> and one last sort of point about the sort of the, the general sort of scheme of my interest is we're also very interested in trying to apply this to technological applications. So I work a lot with Naomi Leonard um, in trying to use these algorithms to design better control strategies for autonomous ro robots. And so today I'm going to talk to you about some work I've been doing over the last sort of six years or so, starting off with group motion and collective memory which is actually the oldest and the newest work combined, and then some work on collective decision-making, and finally to Lucas Hoppers. And I'm sorry for my, my voice, my throat's really going, so I, I hope I survive. <clears throat> so some more gratuitous graphics, but it really does sort of show an important point that it's, you can really see this high degree of coordination within these groups. Again, unrelated organisms. So to get some sort of grasp on that, it's very difficult to think through using verbal arguments. So we resort to computer simulation, and I fortunately work with the BBC, who put very nice graphics on my computer simulations. But this is actually the simulation I'm going to show you now. So we can, just to get a sort of first grasp, a first approximation at what these organisms are doing, we can use very simple mathematical models. And one of the reasons we do this is to create a sort of generic framework by which we can build links between other systems. But another thing I want to sort of stress today is that one of the reasons our models are very are so simple and abstract is because of the dearth of available data. There's a real lack of data on these systems. There's lots and lots of publications that are inspired by swarms, swarm intelligence and collective intelligence and so on. But if you actually look to see, other than the social insects, if you look to see what work has been done on the, the coordination of these behaviors, it's very little indeed. And that's something we really want to remedy. So individuals exist at certain positions, C at time T, and they have a, a direction of travel. 
And in this particular model, that direction of travel is fixed at constant speed. Individuals, as you saw with those sheep, tend to avoid each other when they become too close. They try to maintain a personal space. So they're not sort of, you can't sort of overlap them directly on top of each other. They push away as you push them towards themselves, much as cells would as well. Quick question. Do you worry about the orientation, or do you assume that the velocity is always forward? Yes, forward? that's a great question. So we're assuming in this particular instance that the organism is traveling in, in, in the direction. So it's not sort of skewing to the, skewing yeah. to the side or anything like that. But the, the individuals rotate and, and move on curved trajectories. And so they tend to be attracted towards each other, and they may or may not align their direction of motion with near neighbors, which are those two terms there. And so I'm going to play around with these interactions. Now, what I'm going to use mostly of my technique is discrete time simulation. So I'm going to uh, so let's for, you know, use very small time steps, and then simultaneously update all the individuals within those time steps. We've tried things like asynchronous updating, and for this particular application, it doesn't make any difference. Um, and so the model I'm going to describe to you at first is, is in three dimensions. That arrow there tells you the direction of travel of the individual. And I'm going to formulate those types of behavioral rules that we see in nature. So that very close zone, the ZOR, that's the zone of repulsion. So if individuals are within that zone, your highest priority is to turn away from them. There's also this zone of attraction. This is what keeps groups together. You know, individuals are attracted to each other. It's dangerous to become isolated. And they may or may not tend to align their direction of travel with others in this zone of orientation. And the way organisms do this is they can very simply adaptively change their social interactions. So in a lot of the physics models, you assume that the particles are obeying exactly the same rules. And then you change properties such as thermal noise or density to see how the system changes. And that's very, very important for biological systems too, as I'll show you later. But biological systems can also, in a context-dependent way, or in response to environmental conditions, change their biosocial interactions with each other. And I'm not going to show you the experimental data, but we've done quite a lot of work showing how fish, for example, can change the, the rule sets if you put alarm chemical in the water, food odor in the water, and so on. And they do this by changing the sensitivity of both the lateral line, which detects pressures, sort of pressure sensors, from, uh, which detects the sort of waves created by the fish, but they can also simply change the way, just like we do, the way that we socially interact with each other. So that's an important component here, is that individuals have the capacity to change their, their behaviors. And so if we just have repulsion and attraction, if we assume that there's no alignment tendency whatsoever, what we get is a sort of crazy stable mosquito-like swarm. This is a static image from a moving simulation. And this thing kind of pulses slightly. We don't have any noise. Yes, there is noise. Yes, so there's, there's, I mean, there's spherically wrapped Gaussian noise to the motion of the individuals. In actual fact, for this particular model, it's not that important. For other models, it's very important. I'll come back to, to noise a bit later. But all the models I'll show you today uh, have noise. And so this, as I said, is just a static image. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the individuals can change their rules such that they want to align their direction of travel with near neighbors. Now, in the case of you know, fish or birds, they can use vision. But in the case of cells, you can imagine this could be equivalent to some sort of shear forces created by cell adhesion molecules on the surface of motile cells. And if you get this uh, very, very close range alignment, we get a sudden transition in group states, and we get to this torus formation, where they perpetually rotate around an empty core. And of course, there's nothing in the equations of motion themselves that says go in a circle. That's the stable outcome for these types of interactions. If I increase the size of that zone of orientation further still, we get what we typically think of as a mobile flock or school, where individuals have this directed motion with sort of stochastic changes and so on. Uh, and this just shows you, this is, uh, these are my own graphics, somewhat shoddy compared to the BBC, and I don't know why it's a bit jerky like that, but we can sort of rotate around these groups. And when I first saw this torus, I was very perplexed. I thought there must be some bug in my code. This was actually the first computer code I'd ever written, but when we go to the literature, we frequently find examples of these patterns, particularly in large predatory fish. And it's thought that this particular group conformation allows the group to stay in the same location, which is convenient when you're resting, for example. It means every individual is in the slipstream of every other individual, which may be the most energetically efficient way to be when you have to keep moving. And these fish have to keep moving or else they'll drown. They're too large. They need water to flow over their gills to get enough oxygen. Hmm. But we can also explore some sort of abstract concepts within these models. 
So we all know that individuals can have memory. And in actual fact, I, I, I would argue that ants have a wonderful memory. I mean, even my laziest phylogenosis can remember year after year where they were the previous year, even after hibernating. And even cells, single cells, can integrate information for long periods of time. But what we're interested in here is, is it a form of collective memory? Can the group itself form some form of memory? And so um, we know this from physical systems as hysteresis. So as I described to you before, as I increase the size of the zone of orientation, what I can do is run the model to dynamic equilibrium, and then increase it by a tiny amount, run it again to dynamic equilibrium. And I get exactly what I described to you, this red curve. So if you look at the degree of collective rotation, this is the angular momentum of the group, we go from the swarm state to the torus state, and then suddenly back into this dynamic polarized group state. But running exactly the same model backwards through parameter space, where I slightly decrease the size of those zones and run it to dynamic equilibrium, shows that we do not enter this torus state. And so control theorists have actually proved that this is a genuine bistability within these systems. And uh, Alison Colbus and Jeff Mollis at the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, also looked in this bistable region. And they asked, well, if you have this relatively large bistable region, presumably the system can sort of flip between these different stable states. And they showed that there were only certain types of noise that actually allow the system to flip in this way. So you, again, you can see the um, polarization of the group in black and the angular momentum as the gray line and these sudden transitions within this model system. But what we want to do now is go beyond models. I mean, these models are very useful for sort of thinking through problems. But what we'd really like to understand is, does this really tell us how systems switch between different collective behaviors? And so to do that, we're developing an experimental system in Princeton. This is sort of sped up, I think, three times faster than real time. And these are golden shiners. And you can see them just scrolling around in the tank in the sort of parallel group state. And shortly you see them transition into the torus. And we, have, we use very high resolution cameras so we can reconstruct the fields of view of these fish. We know where their eyes are. So we can actually get the sensory information they're using. By the way, these fish don't tend to use pressure. They tend to predominantly use vision. And so Yell Katz, who's here, has developed some really wonderful tracking software for tracking the motion of these individuals and getting rid of problems such as overlapping. Even though this is a quasi 3D system, we still have a problem with physical occlusion of the fish, and she's managed to solve that problem. And indeed, within these, so what we, we're, we're at the stage now where we can actually observe in great detail these types of phase transitions, phase light transitions, in these types of animal groups. And I'm not going to go into this anymore because Yale has a poster on this where she's looked at different uh, densities of fish within the arena and looked at these you know, multiple transitions between group states, and she shows some of the preliminary work looking at the tracking. So this is very much work in progress, but we're very excited about the possibility of having an easily a uh, manipulable experimental system, but we can actually look at it in this type of manner. And what we're also really fascinated by is how information is processed by these groups in the face of perturbation. <laughs> so you see that response to the predator? I mean, that's pretty amazing. And ever since I was a kid, I've been fascinated by these types of uh, abilities for these groups to respond almost as one. I mean, in the 1940s, people thought there had to be some form of collective mind that they, they perhaps could detect electromagnetic information from the muscles of other individuals, and that's what gives them the very fast response times. But now from our modeling, we know that this is likely not to be the case, um, and we can actually explain it using, using sort of um, more biologically plausible rules. And so this is the same model I showed you before, and I've added a predator and just one more rule, and that's move away from the predator when it comes too close. And you can see these types of collective response. So individuals don't even need to directly detect the predator themselves. They can just detect the response of the, uh, the other individuals. And so this is just a sort of handheld video from our lab where we're trying to actually get a grip on these types of problems in a more controlled way. This isn't particularly well controlled, but it gives you the idea of what we're doing. That predator there is actually a robot. So we can, for example, we can use computer vision to reconstruct its visual field so it can make its own decisions when to attack the group, and so on. So we have this sort of virtual predator here. So those are real prey fish just being tracked with the computer software with ellipses fitted on them. This is the predator here. The big blue line is just the computer tracking software showing you where that individual is. And uh, he or she can, can sort of take into consideration the, the context 
and then choose to attack the group. Come on, there you go. Not particularly dramatic, but that's the only example I have right now. This is, again, very new work. And when we get to very large group sizes within the same system, we get spontaneous pattern generation. And this is something, you know, we do not get below critical group sizes. We get these sort of avalanches crossing the group. And you can see it's very strongly anisotropic. These tend to propagate from the back towards the front of the group. Sometimes they're very tiny, and every now and again you see they're very large. I just showed this as a random sequence. We have some much better ones where we actually get spirals. Uh, crossing the group, which is kind of fun. But there's a little wave there, and there's a much larger wave. You see, So we're kind of interested in all these patterns, and I'm sure people here know much better than we do about what are the appropriate techniques to analyze them. But the general theme we want to push here is can we think of this as a sort of active medium that through the process of natural selection is in a region of parameter space where it can effectively uh, make consensus decisions and process information from multiple sources, and so on. So returning back to the sort of the model framework, um, a few years ago now, I was interested in whether we can get some form of leadership and consensus decision making within relatively simple interacting entities. So again, I'm showing you pictures of fish here, but please, you know, put in your favorite organism, put in a cell there or a robot, or whatever you like. It's a very generic model. Actually, we've done a lot of our experimental work with humans, which I won't show today. Um, so individuals have, you know, some individuals, such as that individual with the red vector there, it may know, for example, that there's a food source over there. It fed there the previous day. Or it may have performed a migration previously, so it has that information. Other individuals, however, may be naive. Does it have to signal to those individuals that it has information? Do individuals need to recognize who has information and who does not for it to be effectively uh, permeated throughout the group? Well, again, we resort to very simple computational models, in this case a two-dimensional model, with just two zones now, just attraction and alignment in the outer zone and repulsion in the inner zone. It's important to have this repulsion to keep density from, you know, from them going down to a singularity. So they have the social interactions, as I previously described, but individuals with information also have goal-oriented behavior. They may want to move in a specific direction. And we're not defining who has information and who doesn't. It's a very generic model. This could be a very transient thing, you know, you may have spotted a predator or a food source, or it may be some sort of long-term memory. It may be cells, for example, that have the machinery to climb a gradient, and other cells that do not. And the other important thing here is that individuals with information need to reconcile their two tendencies, their social tendency with their goal-oriented tendency. Now, I've colored that individual bright red there. That's so we can see which ones have information. And the model has started at random positions, random orientations, and there is no way of knowing which other individuals have information or not. So that's an important consideration here. And so if you have a low omega, you have a weak directional preference, it doesn't, you don't, you know, you're not particularly hungry, you'll just stick with the group as you saw previously. But if, for example, you get very, very hungry, this could become a very important vectorial force in your decision-making process. And so we can ask the question, how many individuals does it take to lead this group, to guide the group? So I have a group of 100 individuals, the big green cross just shows you the centroid. The white individual, again colored for our benefit, is trying to guide the group in this direction along the x-axis. But you can see it's not able to do so. But I have about five informed individuals within this group. After an initial sort of transient, so this is a period of disorder, the group starts migrating kind of in the right direction. You can see information that's being percolated, but not particularly effectively. If we put 10 informed individuals in, suddenly and spontaneously the group moves very accurately in that direction. So to quantify that, we can quantify the, the, the group accuracy from zero, which is random motion, and one, which is exactly in the direction of those informed individuals. And we can see that for all group sizes, the accuracy increases asymptotically. But if you look at the black line there, that's the smallest group size. So for that small group, to be about 85% accurate, you need about half of the individuals to be informed. Now look at the largest group, the red group. For that group to have about 85% accuracy, we only need about 5% of the individuals to be informed. So as group size gets larger, the proportion of informed individuals you need to actually create this collective migration gets much smaller. And we can also do this as a sort of fission-fusion system. We can do this as a, over a, a large plane. We've done this with millions of individuals, showing that a very, very small portion of individuals scattered throughout this group can make it appear as if the entire group 
has come to some sort of consensus and is, is in agreement about what to do. Or that all of the individual cells, for example, in the cell sheet, are detecting a chemical gradient. Well, that may not be the case. Maybe only a very small percentage are. And if we look at the effect of this weighting term, this omega term here, the top figure is that one individual trying to guide the group. And the black represents how accurately it can do so as it increases its omega. Well, it's pretty rubbish throughout. And eventually, it leaves the group behind, and the red just shows you the proportion of times that it splits. So that individual just cannot lead the group. If everyone has information, it's kind of boring, because as long as you've got some degree of weighting, then you're all going to move in that direction. But with the fewer guiding the many in panel B, you can see increasing the weighting increases group accuracy, but comes potentially at the cost of the group splitting and those informed individuals leaving. <coughs> so what about differences in experience and motivation? So far, all of these informed individuals have been you know, in agreement with each other. What about if some individuals disagree? Can the group spontaneously come to a consensus? So this represents a case where some individuals want to go one way, others want to go another way, and others yet are naive. Now, if we wanted to go to the same pub tonight, and five of you wanted to go to one pub, four to the other, how would we do that? I'd probably ask you the question, you'd put your hands up, I'd do a calculation, and I'd say, right, we're going to go to that pub. But these organisms essentially don't have that capacity. Can they actually solve the same type of problem? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix one group, one informed group, at zero degrees. Then I'm going to change the degree to which the other group disagrees with them. So it could be by 10 degrees, it could be 90 degrees, all the way around to 180 degrees, where they actually want to go in exactly opposite directions. And I'm going to have five individuals wanting to go in that direction, and five individuals that disagree with them in the group of 100, and show you what happens. So I'm going to run many, many simulation runs and show you the probability distribution of where the group goes. And as you'll see, below a critical difference in opinion of around 135 degrees, the group spontaneously goes the average direction. But above that critical difference, there's a, a pitchfork-like bifurcation, and half of the time, this group wins out, and half of the time, the other group wins out, and they all go one way or the other. In a large region of parameter space, the group stays cohesive and makes a collective consensus decision. And so I'll talk about splitting a little bit later, but I'm interested at the moment in consensus. What about if I add just one informed individual to one of those groups? So instead of five versus five, I have six versus five. Again, you know, randomly positioned in the group, random orientations. This group could be much larger than 100. Are you saying that the group would never break? I'm not saying the group would never break, no. I'm saying I'm in the region of parameter space where it's very improbable for the group to break. And so here you see the group spontaneously comes to a consensus and goes in the majority direction. What's the white line? The white line just shows us, you know, if they were to sort of be able to ask all of the other individuals, what do you want to do, and calculate the average, that's what it would be. But this, you know, 135 degrees is a pretty damn dif big difference in opinion. In our paper, we look at different types of feedback that individuals can use to adjust that point. But even without that complexity, which I'm not going to go into today, we'll see that if we deal with targets in discrete space, we don't necessarily have a problem. When you're far away from the target, the angle is going to be small, therefore you'll be below the critical difference, or the critical consensus point. You'll be in the averaging phase. But eventually you'll get to the angle above the transition and make a collective decision. So I have an equal number of individuals, colored white that want to get to the white target, as colored red that want to get to the red target, and again, the green are naive. And you'll see in this particular example, they'll choose the red target, and half of the time they go to one and half to the other. But if you add just one more white individual, and I hope you sort of see from the, 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 the visualization how noisy and sort of local these rules are. And you see that they come to a consensus and reach the, the majority target. Now, as I mentioned, you know, this omega term, if you're really unwilling to give up on your opinion, you have a very high omega then the group cannot come to consensus. So there's a region of parameter space where the groups will split. There's another region of parameter space where at intermediate omegas, where the group will perpetually oscillate between the two targets. And we actually see this in nature. It's called track lining behavior. And again, you know, biologists seeing this would think, well, this is a hell of a complicated behavior. In actual fact, it's just because when you get to your target, the directions become uncorrelated with each other to that target, but they're very correlated to the other targets, the other group wins out. And we've actually experimentally validated this, this result now, so we can train fish. And if we don't quite train them well enough, they'll just go back and forth between the two targets. And eventually, they'll, they'll select one. 
And we can also do various other types of mathematical analyses just to, to show that you know, we're not just limited to simulation. Um, so initially with Naomi Leonard and, and now with uh, Steve Strogatz at Cornell, we're doing coupled oscillator versions of these models. And actually showing some very interesting differences between standard coupled oscillator models and the types of consensus decision that we get. But I want to return again to the biology. Because these models, again, are useful for us thinking through problems. But we, it's amazing. Everyone knows about the wisdom of crowds. But who's actually looked to see how vertebrate animals make collective decisions? You know, we looked at the literature. Again, there was virtually nothing. You know, there's, there's the sort of standard stuff about Francis Galton you know, trying to guess the weight of a pig. And what you do is you find out what everyone else's guess is, work out the mean, and that's your guess. But that, of course, is everyone trying to do the same thing. What about if there's a difference in opinion again within these groups? So using a, a rather sort of funny little DC called a sickleback fish, which is a small cyprinid fish, we wanted to ask these types of questions. And again, I was kind of inspired by this video, which uh, a colleague sent to me from YouTube. And uh, these are real fish. But I can tell you that this is not real fish behavior. Hello, I was at Carnegie Mellon the other week, and I asked them what they thought was going on here, and it's meant to be at the Robotics Institute, and they were like saying, well, maybe they're laying a little trail of food, or maybe they've trained the fish, and now I know it's robots. There's two robotic arms underneath the tank, they've put small magnets into the mouths of these fish, which is ethically <laughs> highly genius, and they're actually dragging these fish around the tank using a metal <laughs> uh, You can see fish hate Hate going backwards, being pushed backwards, he didn't struggle with it. Poor little fish. And so, being on the institution, uh, Institutional Ethics Committee at Princeton, I can't get away with that. So, what, what we do is we use um, model fish. So, again, we're sort of re resorting to this idea of using robots to interact with the group. It's a bottom of the plastic fish? Ah, resin, resin, resin. yes, yes. Hand painted. Um, so again, we can use our tracking software to track these are real fish. But what we want to kind of do is really understand, can we build better models that focus more about the biology of the system? And so one way of doing that is to actually close this feedback loop, um, where we sort of interact in real time. We've got eight, eight of these robots now. We're, we're planning to get 16 in the near future. So we're not just you know, limited to being uh, nasty to these fish as, as predators. We can be their friends too, which is nice. Um, so one of our, our initial experiments was asking, you know, what happens if we, if we create some sort of conflict in decision making? What about if we have a different number of individuals going in different directions, so the robots can go up to that uh, target or down to this target, and then in this box here we can have real fish, and ask where do the real fish go? And so Ashley Ward, a colleague of mine who's now at the University of Sydney, did all of these experiments. And he changed the number of robots going in each direction. Don't bother about this slide. I just want to show you that Ashley did a hell of a lot of work. I mean, he looked at every combination between zero and three fish going in each direction, 20 replicates for three different group sizes of real fish. That's a hell of a lot of work. But we can ask the question, you know, if there's three going one way and two going the other, three going one way, one going the other, and so on, how do the real fish behave? And you can see here, when we have a, a conflict, they typically come to a consensus and choose one direction or the other. They don't split very often. But we can go into more details and ask, can we build a model that explains the fish behavior? And so we have a very, very simple model. Fish have a certain probability of making a decision based upon their own information. And they have a certain probability of then doing that, as we do when we make decisions. But like us, the fish also have a, a way of discounting their own opinion if they see others doing something different. So if a certain number of fish choose one direction, that strongly influences them, and they're much more likely to choose that direction. So the parameters of the model are a spontaneous rate at which you accept your own decision and the steepness of your response to what other individuals are choosing to do. And so to show you that in a sort of graphical form, the top figure there is kind of linear. So this suggests that the fish you know, will increase their probability of copying others just linearly in proportion to the number of individuals that have made that decision. If we go to the opposite extreme, so that's a very low value of k. If we go to the opposite extreme in the model, we can have a very steep functional response. Where if one individual does something, you ignore it. If three or four do it, you have a very high probability of copying it. And we can then ask, within this range of parameter space of A and K, where did the real fish lie? 
And so we can find here, here's the spontaneous accept rate, and here's that k-value, the threshold steepness, and the yellow point marks the spot where the model fits best all of the data. So we have a key region in parameter space where we find the real fit. And it's this slope here. So why is it this slope? Why isn't it a steeper slope? Why isn't it a shallower slope? So we can then ask, what would the decision-making of these fish be like were it different? Were they in another region of parameter space? And just look at the X. Don't look at the, 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 the O for now. So at the top, we have the error rate. And here we have the time taken to make the decision. Here we have the range of spontaneous accept rates and the steepness response that the fish could have. Well, the first thing to note at the error rate is, well, they could be doing a lot better. They could be up at the top right there in that blue region, where the error is much lower. But if you look down here, the time to take to make a decision becomes perhaps prohibitively high. Mm -hmm. Similarly, they could make very fast decisions, but you can see the error rate in this region of parameter space is very high. So the fish seem to be trading off this inherent sort of compromise between the speed and the accuracy of their decision making. The, the zero actually marks a, a, a different experiment where we put a risk down one of the routes where I'm not going to talk about that. The key point here is that the fish seem to have adapted their individual behaviors such that they're in a good region of parameter space to make collective decisions. And we can also ask, using this type of quorum response, this nonlinear response, what does this do for you? Does this make you cleverer? So here are two model fish, and I hope you don't see much difference between them. What the fish do, there are tiny little speckles on this one that represents a disease that this species has. But we make it kind of hard for the fish to detect that. So a fish in its zone is only around just below 60% of the time able to detect that and move away from that individual and towards a healthy individual. But if we increase the group size, individual decision making becomes much more accurate. So by associating with others and by integrating their information with yours, you can make much better judgments given imperfect information. Okay, so in the last part of my talk, I want to talk about another sort of devastating and dramatic example of collective behavior. And that's mass migration in insects. And I want to ask basic, basic questions. When, where, and why do insects exhibit large-scale collective motion? And what are the biological processes that underlie both how they do it and why they do it? And I was kind of surprised, you know, when starting this work, to realize that no one knew why or how organisms such as locusts swarm. So here we have very large animal groups, some of the largest in nature, billions of individuals. And this is what we typically see on the news, you know, these large flying swarms. But this is when it's got completely out of control. So it's like a wildfire that's gone out of control. But in actual fact, the locusts will form highly coordinated swarms many months before they take flight, because they only grow their wings in the last stage of life. And so what we have is a very nice two-dimensional system of hoppers. So these are the insects in, in my lab in Oxford before I, before I moved to the States, and they'll form these marching bands. And so, well, why is this important? I did my field research in Mauritania, I'll show you some, some photos in a moment. This is the distribution of the range of just one species of locust, the desert locust. It can evade up to one-fifth of the Earth's land surface. But of course it's affecting poor people, so there's, there's no funding, no research going into it. This is despite the fact that the FAO estimates that the damage lies with of 1 in 10 people on the planet. And as I mentioned, understanding when and where the bands form is critical. And, you know, this is so embarrassing because it was admitted in science, even after 50 years of experience, fighting locusts is more of an art than science. That's embarrassing not just because of the humanitarian impact, but it's embarrassing because the locust is one of the best studied organisms for neurobiology and physiology. Biologists have taken the individual locusts apart to the nth degree. But the last time people put them together in a swarm to see how they swarmed was in 1954, believe it or not. So we wanted to ask a question, a biological question. What is the relationship between the density of these insects and motion? We know populations grow and decline. We know locusts are always around at a low density. But is it something about the population increase that causes the onset of this collective motion? And so we created an artificial arena where we can sort of create sort of periodic boundary conditions. Uh, again, they're not the smartest animals. They'll walk around that arena until they, until they drop dead of exhaustion. But um, this does characterize the actual behavior in the wild. They'll march for 10 hours a day looking for food. We, of course, do feed them, keep them alive. 
Uh, and I've developed tracking software that tracks the motion of these individuals, and so we can get details about how they interact. And so if we look, if we sort of break that down and just look at the angular momentum again, so this is the degree of coordinated motion, negative one being anti-clockwise, positive one being clockwise, we can see at low densities they behave much like a gas. There's not much collective order. But as we increase density, we go through an intermittent phase where the group will rotate one way and then suddenly rotate the other way, and finally into a phase where they collectively select one of the two directions and rotate in that direction for, for eight hours. And this reminded us of some work by Thomas Bishak and collaborators, which I'm sure you'll talk about, um, where they were inspired by magnetic spin systems. So the particles in their model have a certain position, but their future position is dependent on their previous position, plus the, the mean direction of others within a local radius. But the difference with the magnet, of course, is they put in this self-propulsion, this constant speed. And that changes all sorts of very interesting properties about the types of these models. And one of the reasons this model was so successful was because of its simplicity. And so we chose it for that very reason. We wanted to see whether this very simple model that had been put forward by statistical physicists really could explain something that's one of the big challenges in biology. I just stole this uh, nice picture from, from Tamash's book. And we actually find that his theory explained extremely well the transition, the density-dependent transition in these locusts. And I won't go into the details, but we looked at lots of different things you can see this transition from disorder to order as we increase the density. And we can also look at the total time spent in the order phase, the total number of direction changes. And it just blew us away, because biologists for so long have been trying to understand the locus. And yet, here's a, a, sort of a physics model that explains more to us about this transition than any of the biology did. And more recently, actually, we found that the, the standard V-shaped model isn't quite right for the locusts. The locusts are doing something a little bit cleverer. What the locusts are doing, so this is, uh, if you know about Fokker Planck equations, we've estimated the diffusion of the drift coefficients as a function of the coordinated behavior, either anti clockwise, clockwise, or disordered behavior of the locusts. In the V shaped model, this would be flat. That is, the noise that individuals have is independent of the system state. What we find in the case of the locusts, however, is that the locusts have a quadratic function whereby they increase their individual noise when the system becomes disordered. That is, when the system is disordered, locusts add noise to their motion. And counterintuitively, that brings the system back to order more quickly. So I'm going I'm to go to the sort of the biology again, because this is nice. We now know that there's this alignment among the locusts that really gives rise to this large-scale pattern above a critical density. But it doesn't tell us why the locusts align with each other. So we still haven't got to the heart of the biology of the problem. But a chance observation sort of led us in the right direction, which is that my, my postdoc who was working at the time was very annoyed with me because I would run some of his experiments and he'd count them at the end of the day and he'd say, you put the wrong number in. I was like, no, I put the right number in. And he said, no, no. And so eventually I would start actually writing down you know, how many I put in and then going and checking myself at the end of the day. And yes, some of them would be gone. And what we find by looking at the videos was these vegetarian insects would be eating each other. So they'd come up to each other and be biting each other, and sometimes completely consume each other, which really shook us. You know, we were very amazed by this. And so Stephanie Bazazi, who was an undergraduate at the time, is now a graduate student with me, she perfected this technique where she could cut a little hole in the base of a locust, find the nerve that gives the locust sensation to its abdomen, that's where it feels the contact of others touching it, and snip that nerve. And she could, of course, do control experiments where she locates the nerve but doesn't snip it. Well, having your entire abdomen denervated could really annoy you, right? But uh, again, you know, these are really robust insects. And so using the tracking, we showed that in isolation, when they're on their own, the insects that have the nerve cut and versus that don't behave in identical ways. They move the same, they turn the same, they feed the same. They don't know that they have had this operation done, as far as we can tell. But when we put them together in a swarm, individuals with a nerve cut, we make a swarm of them, they don't start marching. They don't create this collective motion that I described to you previously. And so by cutting the nerves, we remove their ability to swarm. And this occurs extremely quickly within these experiments, within a few minutes. 
And we can also specify that it really is contact specifically to the rear that causes the onset of this marching behavior. So we can remove a very specific behavior. Semper also manipulated the visual system in a very high-tech experiment, where he painted different parts of the locus eye with modeling paint. And so the top is a normal locus, the next one's got the front part of the eye painted, this one the back part, and this poor locus is completely blind. And so again we can ask, you know, what's going on here? And what we find is that individuals that are completely blind behave in a very similar way to individuals that cannot see those approaching from behind. So it's critical for you to see and feel others coming from behind. So what looks like a highly coordinated cooperative behavior is in actual fact due to aggressive interactions among the locusts. And it's far from cooperative, in fact it's a forced march. So I tried to study this in the field in Mauritania that I showed you the, the map earlier, and some of Mauritania was very nice. And we did find locusts, which is actually, you know, you think it's easy, but it was a hell of a challenge to locate these swarms. That's the following, these are the footprints in the sand. Uh, that's how we followed the swarms. But unfortunately, uh, we ran out of food, uh, and we, we were relying on passing nomads, uh, and we ended up having to eat camel entrails, which we hung the tree to dry. And I got really, really sick, not being accustomed to camel entrails. <laughs> I, I was actually vegetarian at the time. And um, then this huge sandstorm came, and ruined the whole thing. I spent two months there. I got 20 minutes worth of data, but I'm too traumatized to look at. There's the sandstorm. <laughs> so doing biology is really hard, you know, when you're trying to understand these systems. We go through all sorts of problems. So I ended up working on a system in the United States, which is very analogous, but much easier. Look, there's roads and everything. Um, <laughs> you can see these Mormon crickets swarming. And, you know, nicely for my benefit, there's one chowing down at one of his friends there. Aww. But it's kind of dangerous to do that, to be dragged along underneath himself. And he'll try to find a, a branch to climb up to eat in peace. And we could, again, you know, these vegetarian insects, well, they eat rabbits, roadkill, they crawl in through the eyes and through the mouth. Um, and eat each other. And we can put down these artificial diets. This one's got protein and carbohydrate. Carbohydrate, that's what you'd expect a vegetarian insect to go for. Protein, and this is a neutral diet, no nutritional value whatsoever. And look, they love the protein. They're really driven by their need for protein. And again, with salt, this is like a, a living histogram here. Of course, we randomized it in the real experiments. This is water here, all the way up to two molar salt concentration. And they're fighting over that 0.25 molar concentration. They love that one. And that, of course, turns out to be the concentration of their own blood. <laughs> so we have this new mechanism of collective motion, a forced march, where individuals are attacking those ahead and trying to prevent themselves from being attacked from behind. Stop when you risk being cannibalized. We can then predict that if we save them for protein and salt, we'll inhibit cannibalism and marching. And without going into the experiments, we have the very high significance, we were able to do so. And so that actually leads us back to the physics. So can we then use this, uh, these ideas of just escape from pursuit to create collective motion and the types of phase transitions we see? And in a recent paper, we were able to, to show which properties are really important. And what we'd like to do now is we're using a variety of... So in, a, in a picture, what's P and E? Uh, P is pursuit and E is escape. Okay. Yeah. So... In actual fact, you know, you can see here that escape is really, really important for explaining this type of phase transition as you change density. It's much more important than we see. And so what we're trying to do now is develop new computational techniques, uh, and Vishu will probably talk about this later, um, where we're using graphics processing units, which are, you know, 480 processing cores or so on each one, to be able to start scaling up to, to very large animal groups in aggregate. Um, and, and that's all. Thanks very much for listening. Questions? So are you saying that they sold out and somehow they're That's right. They, they would break apart. But of course, the key challenge in, in control is understanding where these locusts are and where the swarms were actually formed. So the way I think that this is actually going to be useful is using hyperspectral imaging from satellite data, where we can get some information about the protein concentration in, in resources over a relatively small, hundreds of meters scale. Um, that's going to be important, because that's going to allow us to see where the, the conditions are ripe for, for the solitarius locusts to start breeding, 
but where they're going to run short of protein and start clustering over food sources, which inevitably precede these, these swarms forming. So if, I mean, people often ask me, you know, if we could use this to control them. Yeah, you could, but you may as well dump insecticide on them if you can find them. Are they keep them? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, this, is, this is just going to keep the problem going, isn't it? I mean, these, these are, you just help them with and how's the three-dimensional flying forming? I mean, if you broke up the 2D form, would it eliminate the three-dimensional flying forming? Oh, 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 sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, so you, need, you need a sufficient density of the 2D form before you ever get the flying okay. forms. So yes, that's exactly right. If we can break up the 2D form, we won't get the 3D okay. form. Right. Oh, yes. So the question is, what if we had a, a sort of heterogeneous group where we had, you know, healthy locusts and, and a denervated locust in the same arena? Um, I, I would, you know, put my money on that denervated locust being eaten because in our experiments they were more likely to be to be cannibalized. But unfortunately, we didn't we didn't do those experiments um, because it, we can't work on locusts in the U.S. I moved to the U.S. and if they escaped, they could become a plague insect. And so I've unfortunately had to stop all my locust work. But that would have been the, very much the next experiment we would have done. At the time, we didn't quite have good enough cameras to be able to, to see who was whom. Now our cameras are much better, and we could have we could have tagged them. Uh, the, the most sophisticated organism I have worked on is viruses, and I don't have to go to an ethics board for that. Yeah. It's a serious question. Do you rank? Uh, species in terms of what you could do? I and mean, with locusts, you could cut out their nerves, but in fish, you said, you know, the in, I don't know what's the right word, in unethical to put magnets in their mouth? I mean, yeah. where do you draw the line in your ethics? Well, it's, it's, it's not me who does, does this. I mean, the NIH okay. and, and, and various other people have, have guidelines. And, you know, what you could do in the 70s is kind of astonishing to us now, you know, compared to what we can do now. In some countries, a lot of people go up and work in Canada, they've got much more lax, lax laws about working with animals. You can, you can do anything in Canada. Um, <laughs> but um, you can even work on locusts in Canada. Um, but, you know, we, we, we do take it very seriously. We do take it into consideration. These are vertebrates. You know, these, uh, we're, we're dealing with very large numbers, and we want to minimize the stress that these organisms face. My question is, do you make species distinctions? I mean, vertebrate versus... Oh, yeah. they, they do, yes. I mean, some of the invertebrates are actually shoved into the vertebrate class, such as uh, cephalopods, octopi, and so on because they're, they're particularly smart invertebrates. Um, but, you know, the cutoff typically is around invertebrates. Yeah, you, 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 can't, you can do anything with invertebrates. You can step on ants, but not on fish. Well, you know, the other weird thing is, you know, if I wanted to go down and do fishing, I could put live bait in the water, I could beat the fish around, I could spend all day chucking fish around in my own, as my own you know, pastime. But in a research lab, it's very, very strict, so we have to be careful. What I thought you were going to ask is, whether these simple systems were easy to explain the collective behavior of more complex systems. And what we're, what we're actually finding is things like humans are actually the most easy to explain collective behavior. Maybe Thomas will touch on that. Yeah. Um, can you say anything about the studies that you've been doing? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can about some of them, and I can't about some of them. The ones, the ones that I can say about are all published, the ones that I can't say about it, we're trying to get permission to publish. But, um, um, we don't put magnets in people's minds, no. That, that, <laughs> that, would, that would be impractical and not useful in that case. Yeah. We do manipulate them, though. I have a somewhat specific question on the very first model you, you showed, yeah. where uh, you had two uh, steady states and transitions between them. One of the steady states was uh, like a species moving in a circle. Yes. And uh, if the density of species is, is high enough, then the circle has a, a significant weight. Uh, now, from experimental movie, movies, uh, you showed it seems that the angular velocity of the species is the same, which means that the velocity at the outer you know, circle is larger than the inner. Now, but first, you, you mentioned that in the model, you model this as, as all the species have the same uh, velocity. So the question is, how can you get in the model this? this it, kind of yeah, it's, it's an excellent point. I, 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 I maybe should have stressed a little bit further that I did that model a long time ago, 
without ever thinking or dreaming that we'd have an experimental system that would show these types of transitions. Of course, that model may capture some of the essence of what's going on in reality, but it really remains to see. So I, I shouldn't have stressed so highly that that is the right model for that phenomenon. That model predicted those states, and we then get those states, so there may be a certain degree of linkage. But there are certain features that are not explained by that model, such as the variable velocities and so on. So what one would want to do, and that's what Yael is working on now, is generate a specific model for that system. So we often try to generate generic models that can give us insight into a range of systems, but then if we find an experimental system that's really good, we can then go into details, and that's what we plan to do. Okay, two more questions, and then we have to go to a coffee break, which we're always supposed to be coming back from. All right, um, who, whose hands were up? I can't remember. <laughs> um, you showed based on the V-shaped model this intermediate alternating. Yes. Do you understand why the system alternates? Well, I, 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 would, I would refer to, to people like Tamash to ask about this intermittency. I mean, I, I have a, a, a list... Are there other examples that you find like that? Um, yeah, I mean, one, 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 one hypothetical position one, one, one could ask is, do individuals try to lie in that region of parameter space, i.e. to try to actively regulate their densities, such that you get this long-range transfer information, because in this region, so if, in that transition region, you can get very, very long-length scale interactions. Effectively, you, you can communicate with individuals that are much longer range than below or above that transition. And so we, we have no evidence on this particular system because the locusts are so aggressive to each other that they would want to regulate density in that region. But weirdly enough, if you go to the FAO and ask them what density are swarms in the field, it is in that region. So it's something that I think is really intriguing, and we're trying to get funding to, to look at other systems such as the fish to see whether they lie in these, these transition regions for information transfer purposes. One last question. Sure. You mentioned in connection with the fish that they were, were responding, a particular type of fish in your lab, they were just responding to visual cues instead of the pressure on yes. the line. And I wondered, how, how was that figured out? There was a guy called George Lauder at Harvard. He's like the guy when it comes to fish hydrodynamics. And I went up to his, his lab a few years ago because we were interested in working on a range of species. And, and I wanted to know how much things that we need to get into the hydrodynamics. And he'd fortunately been trying for years and years using a 3D um, PIV laser system um, developed by Lex Smith at Princeton, but then sort of improved up at Harvard, to try to see how fish use hydrodynamic forces from each other. And they tried eight or nine species and couldn't find anything. I mean, they find very, very, very subtle differences. So the species like the stickleback that we used, we know that they don't even have a lot of the sensitivity because they've got armor plates over the lateral line. But even these species that could do it don't seem to use it in a perceptible way. But we're not excluding that possibility to the lateral line using chemical means and compare our system with and without the ability. And so that would be the next experiment that we're going to do to check that. Let's uh, all thank uh, you.